Frank is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Damn right. It's a it's a four action season movie. action movie or Christmas movie. Which would you choose? Both. Choose one. <sighs> action. I say Christmas movie. I only watch it around Christmas time. I, I can't. I wouldn't watch that movie in July. I feel like that is a Christmas movie. Uh, it's never a bad time for Die Fantastic Hard. movie. We should do a podcast on on John McClane in general. We should just talk about him. Come to the coast, have a few laughs. So I have written thousands of words across many websites, Forbes, Quora, LinkedIn, my blog, and all those different pages. You can comment, you can ask questions, you can send me direct messages. Um, So having put out so many different articles, I get questions all the time, uh, people asking about career moves and what they should do. And because I am the sucker co-host, if you were to do this with Frank, you would get a contract emailed to you with a non-disclosure agreement and uh, his hourly rate. I actually just respond to people on a regular basis. But one thing that Frank and I were talking about that I find is just crazy is how common a theme is across people that are considering leaving their job. It's always comes down to some kind of loyalty. So either they feel like their company is not loyal enough to them, but in many more cases, there's this feeling of should I be more loyal to my company, meaning should I put myself second in second lean position to my company? Um, so in this episode, we are taking seven or eight different direct messages people have sent to me over the past year uh, asking my advice where loyalty was some kind of theme um, that was holding them back in some way. And Frank and I tried to uh, break down when it makes sense to be loyal and when it is foolish to be loyal when making big um, career moves. If you are new to this podcast, uh, hit the subscribe button so you get notifications when we post new ones. If you are a longtime listener and you have not given us a five-star review on Apple, hit pause, scroll down, give us a five-star review. Don't be such a selfish lover. You're listening to Let Me Speak to a Manager with Frank Cava and Ian Matthews. What a crack of shit. Yeah, that was a hot mic, Sam. You can't say God on the air. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. Do it live! I'll write it and we'll do it live! Frankie! Ian, you son of a bitch. Oh, man. We are talking about loyalty today. Loyalty. What? I'm loyal to you, my brother, but you were just saying before you hit the uh, record switch that you uh, worked out this morning and you haven't yet showered and you're starting to stink. So I'm loyal, but I'm thrilled we're in different locales. Thankfully, a five on four group, there is uh, no one else in this office except me or people would be complaining to HR about the odor coming out of my cubicle. Did I ever tell you the time about that when I had to deal with a guy that smelled really, really bad in our uh, Richmond office? No. Oh, my God. He smelled so bad, and people kept complaining to the managers locally, and they tried to kind of play around with it and, you know, hint at it to them. They got to the point, and this guy really smelled bad. Um, They got to a point where they no longer trusted the local management was going to do anything about him, so they started calling HR. And... uh, It finally got to the point where my branch manager just got pissed off and called him in. She was like, look, it's the point where people are calling HR about your smell. You got to deal with it. Fix it. And uh, the guy quit like a week later. Uh, We think he didn't. Did he really? Did he really? He quit. Yeah, he just quit because pretty much we told him the entire office thinks you smell like shit. And they're now to the point where they're complaining on you. So it kind of killed his loyalty real quick because this guy smelled like ass. (laughs) (laughs) so um so totally different subject than what we're talking about today um so we're talking about the slider you stink (laughs) we're talking about the topic of loyalty today because i notice a trend so i get 
you know, I write every day on LinkedIn. I've written a bunch for Quora. Uh, I get people in the comment sections all the time asking me for career advice. And uh, I either get a direct message or someone comments on something I post. And more and more, I'm seeing the word loyalty, um, uh, abandonment, guilt, um, a lot of things that you would think of more in your personal relationships than you would, or at least I would. Um, at, at my age, I'm experienced more now where I don't think of those things so much from a business perspective, but I see that it drives a lot of people's career decisions. Um, and I, I, I think in general, Frank, you and I are pretty loyal um, people, I think to our friends and to our family. Um, my parents have been married 50 years. Jen, Jenny's parents have been married 50 years. Your parents have been married 49 years, right? Like, like we come from stock where loyalty is important. Um, I've been married personally for 19 years uh, to the same girl, right? I've been, Jenny and I have been together since college over 20 years uh, when we started dating. So I, I think- Four for me, big guy, four. I've been married four it. whole years. You're killing it, that's a big deal. You're coming up on like one, in one year, you'll be ahead of the average, I think, uh, marriage. So that's pretty good. But I, look, I see a lot of value in loyalty when it comes to um, family, to friends. Um, but I think there's, I, I think it gets, I think the average person believes in loyalty, um, you know, in their values. But I think it can go a little bit too far when you start mixing it into, you know, into business. And um, I, there, there ceases, there, there's a point where it kind of ceases to add value. Frank dated a girl for, how long did you guys date? Like a decade? Almost eight years, yeah. Yeah, so before um, his, his current wife, Ellie, um, they dated forever. But uh, Jenny and I were friends with both of them. Um, we were friends with Frank first, um, but really not even. Um, because Jenny pretty much met you at the same time as your ex-girlfriend. So, right. so she couldn't even say she knew you before. Like she- No, we, we literally met Jenny the same night. She was kind of as much a friends with your ex-girlfriend as she was with you. And um, when Frank and his ex-girlfriend broke up, it was kind of traumatic uh, to Jenny, to my wife, because what do we do? Do we, can, do I, do, do I stay friends with both of them? Do we, and she was really, you know, and, and I kind of let her go through that process, but there was a point where she was still kind of down about this, where I had to say, Jenny, we're team Frank, move on. Like you need to understand we can't be on both sides anymore. It's time to cut the cord. I know that sounds awful, but we're team Frank. Like we're not gonna be in social outings with those two anymore. Like we're on the side of Frank and that's where we need to be right now. We can still be polite and cordial, but for the most part, everything's changed and we need to move on. We're still gonna see Frank all the time. We're probably not gonna see his ex-girlfriend. So there are a couple things um, that happened from your perspective, but on my side too, like there were people that were in our lives together and I was just like, okay, like I, I didn't even pursue a friendship with them. I just let them go. Like I always refer to that breakup as the fire. Like I lost them in the fire. Like it was just, um, you know, it was, it was part of it. So that's the healthy side. And I think as a younger person, you might struggle with making those kinds of decisions. This is nothing other than just hysterical. So my mom is the nicest human being on the planet. She sends out like 1200 handwritten Christmas cards. She sends out like, like every obscure holiday, you get a card. It's incredible. My mother's incredible. She's like the most giving person on earth. And she can't see anything other than friendship and loyalty and all of it. One of my uncles, my mom has known, she's pro he's probably eight to 10 years younger than my parents. So my parents got married when they were 22. Um, they've, she's known my uncle since he was like 11, 12 years old. So my mom is still friends in reverse chronological order both of his ex-wives and three of his ex-girlfriends going back to high school. And my mom still invites them to come to things. And it's so uncomfortable. And everyone's just like, what the fuck is Sheila doing here? <laughs>
but she doesn't know how to break it off. She doesn't know my how mom to... doesn't know how to do it. The funniest thing was my uncle goes, my mom says Rhonda. He goes, Hey Rhonda, you still in touch with, um, it was a woman he dated in South Florida. My mom's like, Oh, I didn't like her. My uncle's like, Oh, I'd like to meet her again. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle's single again so he's like oh maybe i'll re i'll rehash that one but that's the one my mom doesn't keep in touch with so it's like this weird element where if you're like if you're not strategically loyal there's this weird element that follows you around with like whose loyalty do you have is it the family or these people who are outside of it and it's like every gangster movie comes down to loyalty. It's one of those things that's it, it's ingrained in most of us. But in some instances, it can be it can be a challenge, and it can be something that's that, that's a struggle for some. And I think it's especially hard for people. Loyalty comes up always when people are trying to decide whether to leave a company, right, um, or to accept a competitor's offer, or to to change because you. It's hard for them to pull the business aspect away from the emotional relationship component you know i i've joked that i worked at carpet world for uh, a one six hour shift while i was in college uh, and that entire shift that entire shift was spent with um the girl i would be replacing who was teaching me the computer system she was the nicest person on the planet she was patient she taught me everything it just the job would have sucked it would have been dead entry and i would have hated it but i couldn't get myself to call Carpet World the next day when I wanted to quit because I felt loyalty to a girl that I had only worked one shift with because she had been so nice to me. I felt like I owed it to the company and her to show up to work and come in and give some kind of return on her kindness. Um, it wasn't the money, right? It was more just she, she had been kind to me. She'd been nice to me. She was great. And I felt like I owed it. Now, thank God I had Paxson who called and acted like me and, and, and quit, quit for me, uh, called the manager because I couldn't do it myself. Um, but I felt loyalty. And I, when, I left, when I left GE, all of my managers who I was loyal to that I loved had been summarily dismissed. They'd been booted, kicked out. They actually promoted me and put me into their jobs. So my manager, I no longer had loyalty, but I had a real tough time leaving GE. Um, that's the only place where I've ever been loyal to the brand, to the company. I felt like this company has really set me up for great success in my life. They gave me a chance out of college. They invested in me a ton as a leadership program, spent a lot of money on me, promoted me over and over. So I was loyal to the brand. That was really hard for me to leave the company. I felt that's the last place I worked where I was like the mission is everything. And I, I was, I was rah, rah. I was still high school, college football team. You know, that's how I thought of work is I'm on a team and we're going to do great things. Um, you know, and when I left MBR, I didn't have any loyalty to my manager. We weren't getting along when I left. Um, my loyalty was not to the brand. I didn't really care about the brand of NBR. It was, the brand of MBR is make a lot of money. That's NBR's brand. Um, so that was an easy place to leave for me because the, the mission of NBR was always real honest, return money to shareholders, make, make the stock go up. So financially it was kind of easy company to leave because there isn't much of a mission there except make profit. But I had trouble leaving NBR because I was loyal to my team. The people that reported to me, they were really hard workers. I'd worked with them for a decade. I had a lot of these feelings of, man, I'm leaving them behind, you know, what's going to happen with their careers. So I struggled in that one. So for, you know, those are three different examples of companies that I've left. And in each one, I had some feeling of loyalty in my gut that was keeping me from making the decision. So for me, whenever I've, so I've had a handful of jobs in my life and that's been it. So like the Outback. I moved from Coral Springs to Gainesville and I ultimately quit the Gainesville job because I was graduating from college and it was time to get a real job. So there was really, that always had an expiration date because I knew that that wasn't my, my career. So that was an easy one. It was hard to leave the people, but it was easy because I, I, there was other things to do. For me, NVR 
and other opportunities that I've had that I've had a hard time letting go of, there's something otherwise that's kind of lurking underneath the surface. And I, I, I haven't really ever talked to you about this, but I've talked to other people in my life about it. There's a willing arrogance to think that you're going to be just as good or better off without this place. And there's that you have to confront that. And what I mean is NVR paid me a lot of money. You must have insane confidence or arrogance in yourself if you're going to leave that opportunity and do something else. It's why so many people stay. In our last episode, we talked about the golden handcuffs you had and why everybody, nobody can figure out why you left so much money on the table. It's because you're like, it's enough. I can deal with it. I believe in me. And so, so like whenever there's an opportunity what pays a lot of money or is strokes your ego or something, you have to be self-confident enough to leave something. And that's very hard. Um, and what I can tell you is that I've struggled with it. Like I'm not someone who struggles with self-confidence, but like leaving something behind that works well or pays you well it, you have to have, it, it, it's tough. And then what happens is you quit and you have this huge chasm and then you, and then you look back and you're just like, well, that was a mistake. So like for a period of time, you have to just weather the storm to kind of get through it. So I think a lot of the questions that we're going to get into me and come down to, is it self-confidence? Is it, am I, do I deserve more? Am I going to find better? What if I get out of this like in the relationship we talked about, like for years, I thought about, should I get out of this relationship? And I was like, I was always pulled back to, well, it's pretty good. It's not that bad. Like, am I going to find better? Like, I hope she isn't listening to this. I married into a better situation for me. I am happier, but for eight years, I couldn't figure that out. And I live with that, like in that purgatory where once I made the decision and I found the person who I was right to be with, it was different. I think there's, so there's the, do I have enough confidence in myself to go? So should I be loyal to something that's safe? Um, I think there's a whole other side to this, Frank, where there's an overconfidence of what would this place do without me? Yes. Um, that, that this is through the, so this episode today, we're going to go through a bunch of people that have asked me advice and I, I kept it and we're going to just read what they said to us. But there's a lot of what would this company do without me? What would my manager do without me here? What would, how is my team going to survive without me? And it's, um, I learned this lesson the hard way because I had a little bit of this at GE, like shit, I work a hundred hours a week. I, I know the business inside now. No one can do this general manager of sales job. Like I know every one of the 110 sales reps. I know their customers. I've been to their key accounts. Like no one can do this job the way I can. I get these guys backs and I gave my notice on a Tuesday and by Friday an email was out saying who the new general manager of sales was. And I was like, oh shit. Okay. They're going to be okay without me. It was this real humbling moment of, you know, I can give you two months notice if you'd like, I can, you know, and G was like, no, we're good. Thanks for your service. <laughs> that was kind of it. And they moved on. Right. But I think everyone has this overinflated sense of how important they are to the company. And the truth is you're just not that important to your company. That, that, that's truthful. And the, for I remember feeling something very similar. Like I resigned as a division manager, which was a you know VP level job. And I remember job and driving jobs. I did nothing to do. So I went and drove job sites to like the next, like the day I quit, I was like, I got a coffee from Starbucks and I drove job sites just to drive around. It was really early. And um, like, I remember watching construction happen. There was a heater in a house, heating the house. And it's just like, nothing changed. Like I just didn't work there anymore. And it kept on moving. That's right. That's right. And I, you know, Frank's built an incredible company. Kava company is an incredible company. If Frank shut it down tomorrow, someone else would be buying those houses, renovating them, flipping them, renting them. Life will move on in Richmond without Frank immediately starting tomorrow if you shut it all down. And, and that's, I think that's always a good thing that I like to tell myself all the time is just to remind myself that in the scheme of things, I'm not important because I do have a huge ego and it does tend to get ahead of itself. So I have to remind myself of that stuff all the time. Like if you quit, someone else will fill in that gap and the world will just keep moving and no one will remember you even did it in the first place. 
free market capitalism makes it so gaps are filled quickly. There is a competitor who we're beating for a deal today who would beat us for a deal if we weren't doing it tomorrow. And the market, you're being too self-important if you think anybody's going to remember any of this. Like there are people who have done so many things for history that are completely and totally forgotten about. What we're doing is completely and totally irrelevant. So if you keep that mind frame, I think that helps set this. And there's a balance too, right? Like one of the questions we're going to get to is an older person who's only got a handful of years until they retire. Like, where are you in your career? Do you want to take on this risk? Have you properly, another example, have you properly saved where when an opportunity comes by, if it doesn't work out and you have to take a step back in your career later, are you positioned where you can make a change to try something? These are all things that it, 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 there, there's not a right answer. And it like to, um, Nesim Tlaib in one of his books talked about if on 9-10, September 10th, 2001, the FAA had mandated that the, every uh, commercial airline had to have a tamper-proof door. 9-11 doesn't happen. We never know about it. It just goes away. It's just something that has gone from one of the more traumatic moments in U.S. history to it doesn't exist. And we tend to oh, we undervalue the importance of those things because we just move past them because we don't know what happened. So it, it, it's all part of that. It's like we're, we're making ourselves too important. And, and like this is a sentinel event where really it isn't. I think that's all. That's all right. I, I I'll add one other thing. Um, you know, I was 28 when I joined NVR as a, a region manager. So I'm, I'm an executive, I'm young, but I, I think I was still kind of doughy eyed and still into the whole concept of team and loyalty and us versus them. And um, very early in my career, the CEO of NVR, who, you know, had a very analytic, objective mindset, um, he said it in multiple meetings. He never said it around the rank and file, just in meetings with executives when we were talking about morale and loyalty and retention and all these things. But he had a thing that he would say that always just was jarring to me. He would say, the company and the employee break even on the 15th of every month. MVR only paid once a month. So on the 15th, you got your paycheck. But in essence, what he was saying was, we pay people to do their job and do it well. And you don't build a pile of chips like you do in a poker table that you can call on. You have to keep performing great every month or we find someone else to do it. And that instructed, that had a big impact on me. That instructed my views of loyalty and work, which is you're never done proving yourself to a company and vice versa. The company is never done proving itself to the employee. If they break even on the 15th of every month when that paycheck happens, then both of them have to go prove themselves again. The company has to prove why the employee should stay there versus other options. And the employee has to prove why they belong in the company and are they as productive as someone else that the company could pay. So without further ado, let's get into some of, uh, some of these comments that um, I have received, uh, many of which I've responded to already, but I think they were interesting to go through. So this is, um, this is a person who sent me a message on um, LinkedIn. Quote, I am working in a toxic environment and I'm starting to look around for a new job. My team is the biggest thing holding me back. I feel like I would be abandoning them if I were to leave, as many have told me that I am the only reason they are sticking around. So this person clearly has the guilt of abandoning their team as a manager because there are negative forces. So this, this person is the human shield. So there are a-holes above her and she really likes the people beneath her. And so she feels like she is a shield for this toxic environment that everyone is working in. So as you, as you read this, Frankie, what kind of thoughts does it bring to your mind? So I go in a completely different direction with it when I read this. So the person thinks, as many have told me, I'm the only reason they're sticking around. One of the exercises that I regularly put my staff through is when somebody communicates something, I ask the group to restate it. So like this morning, we did a training on critical path pretty cut and dry with critical path is there's three main drivers of critical path. 
I asked the team to restate it. They only got two out of the three right, which is fascinating. And as they talked about the importance of it, it was quite different than what the construction manager had said. Now, I speak construction well enough to know what those things are and relate it, but other people in the company don't. So why do I use that example? Quite simply for this, everyone has their own narrative. So this person who's saying, I'm here, because I'm the only reason people are sticking around, Maybe it's true, but maybe it isn't. Maybe that's the one thing you've decided to listen to. Maybe that's the one thing you're retaining because it makes you feel better. What I will tell you is that human beings are resilient. So if you are staying just for that reason, you're doing a disservice to yourself. And if you do go, kind of like the example that you and I both use that we left big companies and we were replaced immediately, someone's going to step into that role and it might, it might be one of the people who is so happy to have you around gets tasked to be a leader and they're in a better spot. Like it, it, it's basically just boils down to an excuse. I think there's also something here of um, if you stay in a toxic environment, let's say it's truly a toxic environment and I, I have no reason to do anything but take uh, this person at face value. I trust her. Um, so if you're working in a toxic environment and you have no control over the people over you, they're just bad people, and it doesn't look like that's going to change anytime soon. Are you, are you culpable for that toxic environment by staying and enabling it and being a manager in that environment? Because I, I, I don't know, when I, when I look at that, by staying, you're feeding it. You're, you're feeding it. You're letting it succeed you're, you're by holding it up, by being, by being a stanchion, by, by being a support column for an, for a building like that, you're keeping it up. Like aren't you're aren't part of the problem Better job for people by letting it fail, leaving. And maybe then if you're the only reason your team's staying, if you leave and they all go find something better at some point, the people that are jerks above you will get such bad results that they're exposed and they either have to change or they're replaced. In the, in the famous words of John McClain from Die Hard, hey, you're being part of the problem. <laughs> Start being part of the solution and put the other guy back on the phone. It's absolutely part of it. Like, it, mm. exactly. You're perpetuating what's happening. Frank, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Damn right. It's a, it's it a four action season movie. action movie or Christmas movie. Which would you choose? Both. Choose one. action i say christmas movie i only watch it around christmas time i, I can't wa i wouldn't watch that movie in july i feel like that is a christmas movie uh it's never a bad time for Diary. fantastic movie we should do a podcast on on john mcclain in general we should just talk about him come to the coast have a few laughs <laughs> so here's so i think if you have that guilt of abandoning your team think about the fact that if it's really that bad there your team is going to ultimately either rise up when you leave or they're going to find something better. They're, they're just going to, if it's that bad, you're not helping them by protecting them a little longer to stay in a crappy environment. All right. So let's, I, I want to say one more thing before we move into something differently. So let's just say you're abandoning your team and then you find a better place to be. Every, like I have a small business. Almost every time I hire someone, they pick someone from their last job and bring them with them. It happens a ton. Like 70% of the people who work here have relationships with somebody else who worked here. Referrals are our number one method of recruiting. Yeah. So if you're the manager and you find a better opportunity and you go there, as long as you don't have a non-compete where you can't poach people, if you find a better opportunity, it's probably a better opportunity for others. So by taking that first step, you might be able to do an even better service to these people by reaching back. Now, what you're going to notice is there's been a reshuffling of the deck of the place you left. Some of the people are happier. Some of the people are in the exact same spot. Some of the people may have already left or are worse, but some of the people are going to say, you know what? I got promoted. I'm not going to leave, but a couple of people might come with you. And that, and then, that, and that's real. I love all of that. And I, I think a theme that's going to go through this that I believe very strongly it's work work the definition of work is trading your hours for money and that you can't get that mixed up with other things that you do so this whole concept of abandoning anything um 
just to, if you really look at it objectively, doesn't make sense. Yep. And I so, feel like in the, the next one we're getting again to use the guilt of abandoning a manager. I think a lot of the themes are the same. Go ahead. I think so. So uh, this next person, our company got a new vice president six months ago and the culture has completely changed. This guy is an awful person and we've been losing people faster than we can hire. My manager is great and has always been loyal to me, but he has no influence over the VP and feels like his job is now at risk. I have an opportunity to leave for a competitor, but I would be leaving my manager in a terrible situation that would only get worse if I left. So this one's a little different. This is a manager who is not feeling the guilt of abandoning their team so much as the guilt of abandoning a manager that they like who is caught up in the middle of this. So a manager who finds themselves working for a new vice president who is terrible and doesn't like them. So it sounds to me like this person's manager is probably on the outs and their worry is by leaving their performance would get definitely worse and that would be the final nail in the coffin that would get their manager fired. So they feel guilty about abandoning their manager and leaving them in a bad place because their manager has always been good for them. So I heard a story years ago. Um, Bill Parcells is, um, he, he was, you know, Bill Belichick's boss at one point. Bill Parcells has won two Super Bowls with the Giants. His star quarterback the first time was Phil Simms. So Phil Simms had a son who is now on television, Chris Simms, and he was the number one prospect in America. He was like USA Today back when they had newspapers, player of the year, Gatorade player of the year. Like he could have gone anywhere he wanted to go. And his parents, especially his mother, were insanely protective and like getting in the midst of this. And what Bill Parr said was, I'm going to give you one piece of advice. And it's the last piece of advice I'm going to give you. And she goes, okay, we'll do whatever you say. He goes, I don't think you're gonna, but I'm going to tell you anyways, cut the cord. And he meant, let the kid make a decision on his own. If you've got a talented manager and you're staying there because you think that manager is going to fall down, he need to cut the cord. Like if they're that strong of a manager, they're going to figure out who to promote from within, how to do certain things. You're, you're, I, I disagree with that because if, it, if they're a good manager, they're going to make it. If they're a bad manager, they're not. So like if you do have a friendship with someone, you can be strategic in how you talk about it. Hey, I'm going to pull you in in confidence. I'm really not seeing my future here as much. I'm really feel, fearful that I'm going to let you down. You can have those discussions closed door, but ultimately I think you have to make just like above, I think you have to make a decision that's best for you. It's always got to be what's best for you, period. I mean, it's, I've talked in here about um, my managers at GE that we had a reorganization. They found themselves out and Macaulay and I, a friend of mine, we were both managers. We had to make a decision very quickly were we going to just be loyal and sulk and feel bad, or are we going to go meet the new decision makers and make an impression on them? And uh, as much as that sucked because those managers were great to us, they no longer had any influence. And the truth is, you know, when I looked back on it, they weren't thinking about us in that moment. They couldn't. They had to think about their own career. They, they couldn't help us knowing they were on the outs. So it's not like they were like, well, we're, we're getting fired, so let's go out of our way to make sure Ian's taken care of. There was none of that. It was, what do I do next? What's happening? So I had to go fend for myself. So feeling, although I felt a little bit of the guilt, when I look back on it, it was completely misplaced and it made no sense because your manager is always going to look out for themselves first. No one's paying attention to your career except you for your whole career. It, and and, and if, if a manager is really involved and cares about your career, it's because it's good for them at the moment everyone, everyone has to look out for themselves first. You just have to, that's, that's a fact. For, for sure. I'm trying to think of the right example and I can't come to terms with it, but, or come up with it, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of skirt around it. Like it feels like a Costanza, like something's burning around you. That's the one like Costanza in an episode, he goes to his girlfriend's kids party. You, the, the, you could go that one or another one, right? Like there's a house burning down that his girlfriend owns 
And while the house is still burning, he looks at her and he says, did you remember to give me change from dinner? Like, like it's, it's so selfish, right? It's like, it, 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 that's what it comes down to. It's, it, it's, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta think about yourself. So here's one that might resonate with people because there was a lot of this going down in 2020 with COVID. So quotes, uh, my company is undergoing dramatic financial issues. And last week, management cut everyone's salary by 10%. Management is adamant that this difficult time is for staff to give back to the company and make sacrifices for the whole. All my friends and family say I should run and find a new job ASAP. I feel hesitant because I did really like my job before this happened and felt like I had a career tra trajectory at this company. I'm also struggling to determine if I owe it to the company to stay, put in the work and help them weather the storm, or am I a traitor if I leave? So I think this theme is how much do you owe a company when it goes through hard times, when it goes through um, something difficult like a recession, like a uh, new competitor in a market, like a um, uh, COVID event um, that really impacts them. Um, and I think this one, I think this one, Frank needs, uh, needs caveats. I think this one needs several um, follow up questions that I would have for this before I would just completely weigh in because I think my answer would be it depends. And what it depends on is, is the financial issue temporary in a great company? Or is it uh, a canary in a coal mine? that your company might not be as good as you thought it was. So the two that I will use, GE, GE was, was fumbling financially the last couple of years I was there and you felt the pressure within the company that Jack Welch is no longer here and our new CEO is a dumbass. Jeff Elmelt was just a bad CEO, he just was. It took him 15 years to figure it out, but that book's been written. Um, so I saw it as, I don't see this as temporary. I see this as systemic problem that just gonna be, the place is gonna stay broken versus an NVR when in 2008, 2009, the financial crisis hit. Yeah, it sucked working at NVR, but it sucked working everywhere. Everyone was taking pay cuts, uh, bonuses were slashed, stock options were all underwater, weren't worth anything. Everyone from the front lines all the way up to executives made less money for three or four years. But I saw that as this is temporary. Everyone's going through it. I work at a phenomenal company that's going through a extraordinary event. And so for me, I would rather be loyal to a company and grind my way through that recession um, because I knew that the company would be fine later. So I'm gonna reread the part of the first sentence. The company is undergoing dramatic financial issues, and last week, management cut everyone's salary by 10%. As a management credo or axiom or guiding principle, that's not how I look at it. I don't think there's any good in cutting individual people's salaries by a certain percentage. Now, bonus is different. Bonus is earned based upon profitability. You're in lockstep with that with the company. The way that I handle- And if you have a good enough bonus plan, you don't need to even announce anything. Just the, the recession means that you didn't deliver as much as you were going to, and we're not paying bonuses. Right, during 2007 through 12, I worked for the same company as you for part of that. Like I never went to my boss and said, um, I'm unclear, what are you doing for my bonus? Like I, I, but this is why the company went through. So NVR and downturn went from 6,300 employees to 2,900. They went from 60 something divisions to 29 divisions. When COVID hit, I went from 24 employees to 17. Now, I had one guy who worked here who literally asked me for a raise a week after I fired 27% of my staff, like just tone deaf. But what I did is I picked the people who I thought gave us the best possible chance to survive in the downturn. Instead of potentially limiting everybody, I didn't do it that way. I looked at it from a systemic standpoint of it's a bad market. 
I want the absolute best people. We need to get leaner and this is how we're going to do it. So from a leadership standpoint, I don't believe in a slow bleed. I've seen the city of Richmond, municipalities, hotels, people with bosses who don't have the critical thinking skill or the courage to make a big reduction do a small bleed like this. So what I immediately think of if somebody does this and it doesn't have insanely good reasons, like you never see in the Wall Street Journal that Amazon's cutting salaries by 10%. You'll see a, another company cutting staff or they'll have seasonal. So like to me, the fact that everyone's being cut across the board 10% is not good leadership. That's like, good I leadership. Would see- and that's, that, that's, that's um, to me, that is the sign of a company that doesn't have an meritocracy. Um, they, they, um, they, there's, there's the no way that sees every person as a commodity. So they all deliver the same amount, no matter what. That's Whereas right. If, like if you said we're cutting costs 10%, yeah. Yes, There's, I'm in it. 20 people on my team, two got fired. That's not a reason to leave. That's just culling the, the weak players off the team yep. that aren't yep. delivering enough. But if you're having to cut everyone 10%, that means your volume is still the same. You still have the same workload. You're just asking everyone to work less. Well, if you have the same workload, how extraordinary are your issues? Or, or, or your management team is inappropriately focused. What we did in COVID is we did a few things. We fired a bunch of people because we needed to, because we were scared. Second thing we did, like concurrently with that, like those conversations happened on a Friday morning. By 11 o'clock, I had the seven or eight leaders of the, of the entire company on the phone. And we went through the P&L and we said, where can we cut? Then I stayed on with the bookkeeping department and said, where are, our, where are our receivables? When is money coming in? That's a proactive approach. And then what we ended up doing is with it, and then we, 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 when we rehired, we didn't know if this was a false start or not. We hired people on lower bases with more incentive based upon commission because we're thinking proactively. That is a company that, in my opinion, that's a company you want to be a part of because they're looking at things in, the, in a strategic manner and they're valuing the individual, not just making a blanket move, which clearly doesn't call you out as an individual yeah you know ultimately is this temporary do i work for an extraordinary company who's going through a tough market or do i work for a tough company that is not going to get better and if you feel like this is just a crack in the armor and you see that this company's not run well and now it's getting exposed i would leave i don't think you're a traitor i think you're smart by going and finding a better opportunity that gives your career a little bit better growth. Agreed completely. So next one, uh, quotes. I've been working at my current company for 12 months and generally enjoy my job. Recently, however, the organization has lost a major contract and rumors are rife that other large contracts will be pulled as well. I wanna start a job search just in case things do get worse, but I am worried this will make me look flaky to potential employers particularly when expressing why I leave my current job. I'm concerned that by telling the truth and saying I'm worried about my job security, this will look like I am disloyal to my current employer for jumping ship before it potentially sinks. And so this question that this person is asking, will I be punished by job seekers for not appearing loyal? So I'll I'll go first here. I think it depends on how you describe it. If you describe, I'm seeing handwriting on the wall at my current job. Hey, I'm I'm a staff person, but I'm hearing management use symbols or language that leads to me to believe that we're having problems. I think that's a high level of critical thinking, and I reward that as a hiring manager. I think it comes down to how do you talk about it? What do you do? Are you discreet? Are you not? And it very much comes down to how do you execute and, co- and, and communicate what's happening? I, I think that's right. I think, um, I think this concern is way overblown. I think one, you're giving way too much thought to what a hiring manager is thinking about when they're with you. Uh, they're happy that you decided to come to the interview. By nature, when I'm hiring, I'm looking for people who are a little bit unhappy in their situation, because if not, they wouldn't be interviewing with me. And when I have an open position, 
I'm glad that your company has not treated you well or you're concerned about things because that means I have an opportunity to hire you away. So I, I can't remember ever just sitting with someone and thinking, man, you're disloyal for interviewing with me. I just, I've never thought that. There's, there's a reason why you're talking to me. You either don't like your manager, you don't like your job, you're not being paid enough, you're worried about your company's stability. There's a reason you're in front of me in the first place. So there's not, it's not like I'm so great that I just pulled you in. There's something wrong. I'm normally getting to it. So I'm normally gonna ask you a question like, why are you leaving? Why are you considering leaving? Why did you leave the last company? If you explain it, just be honest, be honest. I, you know, I'm worried think, about my company's financial stability, to be frank. I think the question falls in the arrogance again. It's like, it, it comes down to, you know, how can anyone think of things otherwise or different than me? And the answer is people do, especially hiring managers. Like I have, I, I hire very few people who are in destitute situations. Like I don't hire people who don't have homes and to my knowledge, like I mostly hire people who already have a different job. They're just slightly unhappy, but performing well there. That's part of the life. And I know right now, if I become a shittier employer, and I don't treat people well, they're going to leave. That's how this whole thing works. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a give and take to all of it. And if you walk into the interview and you're just honest, I actually look at if you're sitting in front of me and you're like, I work at a good company, but I just, I don't like where they're going morally. I don't like where they're going structurally. They made a couple of changes. We used to provide this. Now we provide that. I don't like it. I don't believe in it. I don't think it has sustainability. Like, holy crap, you're a dynamic thinker. Tell me about your industry. We're off of your loyalty and we're on to your critical thinking skills, which is what you want me to analyze. You want me to understand how are you thinking? Because then in my head, I'm thinking, wow, this person here can do these things for us. You're winning the interview. Or nothing's changed with the company. I've changed. I'm no longer stretched. Also there. good. Also I've, good. I've, I've achieved everything I possibly can at this company and I'm bored and I need a new challenge and I'm excited for a new challenge. My company hasn't changed at all and that's okay. I have no bad feelings about them, here's, but they're not for me anymore. That's here's okay. My here's my follow-up. What have you done to change? I've read a bunch of books. I've gone to some seminars. I've, I took some read. Boom. You're now talking about you, development, growth. We all want people who are, who, who are pushing themselves. I also think, you know, a, far from being punished by not appearing loyal, I think there's a way you can use this to appeal to the ego of the hiring manager you're talking about. Hell like, yeah. My company just doesn't have what your company has to give. And here's what I've done in my research that tells me that this is a better next career stop for me. Your financial discipline, your growth is better. You promote from within more. Your, the tools that you give people to do their jobs. I've, I've, I've checked in on a few sources and they've told me about the great management here. I don't have any of those things where I'm at. I would like to get to a better opportunity, which I believe is your company. What hiring manager doesn't want to hear that you did that kind of homework and that you really want to come work for the company. I want to talk to people that are excited to come work for my company, not just a bigger paycheck. Yes, agreed completely. Next one, quote, my friend recently interviewed at a potential employer. The feedback was good, and he has now heard from his recruiter that they are going to make an offer. However, the recruiter also said that the employer asked my friend to, quote unquote, show loyalty and stop interviewing for other roles while they put the offer package together. Is it reasonable for a company to demand something like this? So the question here is, should I stop my job search once a company says they're putting an offer together for me? So the first thing I think about here is the element of time. How much time has gone by? Is it days, maybe a week, 10 days? It, so we typically can turn, we're a small company. We typically turn from an interview to a job offer. If we're going to offer you a job, usually you get a call from us within two days. Usually it's that day, but within two days and we say, hey, we're offering you a job. You'll have the paperwork by this date. And most, unless it's a new position, we've got most of the paperwork ready to go and we can turn it pretty quick. Or I might call you up and say, hey, so-and-so is out of town. 
they have to draft the offer. It's going to be in your inbox by this particular day, but we are offering you a job. Everything we talked about, I'd prefer you not take something else or call me first because we really do want you. It's just, I got a paperwork snag, but, but, but shy of that, if you found the right job, I, I think it makes sense to pause. Now, if they're saying, you know, it's been eight weeks since you've interviewed and they can't get the paperwork together, like that to me does not seem like you should wait. I look at it as if you're dating and there's, you know, you've got two girls on the hook that you're going after. One is clearly your favorite. And if the favorite says, I'm pretty sure I can go on a date with you on Saturday, I would probably wait and put on hold the second. If the second said, maybe I would keep pursuing the first because that's the one I really want anyway. So to me, it's a little bit more about, is this the company you really want based on your research? And if it is, and they ask you to chill on looking for something else, I'd chill until I got an offer to see what it was. Now, if it was my backup company that I was going after and they asked me to do that, but there was a company I'd rather work with, I'd keep pursuing that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop just because they asked me to do it. So really to me, it just depends on, how much do you want that opportunity and how excited are you about it? So I think there's two, there's two sides of the coin here. So when I was graduating from college, um, I wanted the NVR job and I had met NVR and they just moved at a glacial pace. It was so freaking slow. And I remember I called Joe Madigan up and I said, look, since I've met you, I've gotten like eight job offers for companies that I met at or after meeting you. And you guys haven't even gotten me into an interview yet. And are you going to interview me or like, should I take one of these other opportunities? He's like, no, he gave me some story. And ultimately that was the job I took because I trusted it. You know, there was just an anomaly in the delay. Now I work as a consultant um, and I talk about it a lot. I see companies that are not organized. If there's a company that's not organized that can't get your job offer together, they're like, hey, we're going to give this to you. That's why I said like, you know, eight weeks, that's an exaggeration. Like if, if someone runs an ad and comes in and you meet with them and they can't get you something in a reasonable amount of time or they can't explain to you why there's a delay, that's a red flag to me. Like that's when I keep shopping because it's like, well, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. But if, if it's the girl of your choice and the girl's showing interest, then I think it's prudent to wait. Well said. Next one. Quote, my company paid for my MBA and has genuinely been good to me, but I've felt trapped and stagnant here for the past year and don't see it getting any better. I do feel a sense of loyalty because of the investments the company made in me. I've approached my manager about future opportunities, but keep getting the be patient advice. And I think he is just stalling because our company is not growing. So this one is the company invested in you significantly, an MBA or an executive MBA could be 100 to $200,000. So after they made that investment in you, how long should you feel like you need to stay to give them a return on that investment? So I think a well-run company is going to have this papered. Like if we pay your, for your MBA, you need to work here for X number of years after that. Um, there, there needs to be some kind of documentation. But I immediately, when we had this question, thought of this. In Seinfeld, um, the character of Elaine is dating this guy who is about to become a doctor. And she's very excited because he's about to become a doctor and she doesn't really wanna date him now, but she wants to date a doctor. And the doctor then, he becomes a doctor, it's official. And he walks in and he get, breaks up with her. And she's like, well, why are you breaking up with me? He's like, well, I wasn't a doctor. Now that I'm a doctor, the dating pool is gonna get so much better and I need to break up with you because I'm now a doctor. So I think it depends on what side of the fulcrum you're on. Part of what happens in getting an MBA is you become a different person. You become more educated, you become more exposed. So if the company, hopefully the company is smart enough to realize that they need to give you more to do. One of my uncles went through this. He worked for a company up in New England and they paid for his, um, they paid for law school. Uh, and when he was through, he stuck around for a while because of loyalty, but then he's like, I got to quit. And they basically said, yeah, we thought you'd quit by now. So like 
this is part of it. So I don't know if there's a right answer there, Ian, but what I talk about is it, it ultimately it comes back to you again on what's right for you. So I think you led with this pretty well, though, as, as, as an executive, if I'm going to pay for your MBA, I'm expecting a return. It's a lot of yep. money, $100,000 yep. on top of whatever I'm paying you. It's a lot of money. So and, 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 and one second, you're paying for $100,000 and your salary, and you're probably not giving me 100% effort at work because of the fact that you're spending a lot of your effort and time getting your MBA or your, your law degree or whatever. So there's some sunk costs from the employer standpoint too, because you're not producing, you're not hundred percent focused on work. Sure, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it if I thought you were just going to mail it in for the next two years while you got it. I'm, I'm still expecting you produce. At least 80, 85%. Used. Yeah. Five, 90%, you're st- which is better than someone I could find in the street. Sure. So I'm thinking, okay, this locks you in for two more years. I get two more years of good work from an employee that I like. And I'm also thinking, I need to promote you rather quickly after you get your MBA or you're going to be gone. I would not invest in something that would make you dramatically more marketable without having a position pigeonholed for you. I I would be thinking, okay, once he has the MBA, I think that's when we go from vice president to managing director or something bigger, something with more stock options. I would be thinking that, or I would be thinking, I'm going to paper this, that if you leave within three years of getting the MBA and us spending the money, you pay me back on some kind of a waterfall. So what I would say is your, if, if you're not happy and your company paid for the MBA and they didn't pay for this in a way that keeps you there, that gives you some non-compete or something else that keep prevents you from leaving and you're not happy and now you have this new education and you're still not in a bigger job and that MBA could get you a much better job, leave. There's that that's on your company for spending that money, not papering it and not giving you something bigger because they clearly knew your aspirations were very big. If you were willing to give your weekends and nights for two years to get more education, you're clearly not a person who's okay with staying in the job you're in. And if they can't give you something bigger, well, to me, that's on them. And and a good friend of mine left GE within months of GE paying for him to get his MBA at Notre Dame. And it was the smartest move. They, they, They had no teeth. He got that money and they didn't give him a bigger opportunity. In fact, I got promoted over him into a bigger job and he didn't get it. He left, went to a company and in the first year made triple what GE would have paid him. It was a smart move. It would have been dumb for him to stick around for whatever time he thought would give them a return on the MBA. That was on GE. That wasn't on him to stick around. That's They spent that money. They took that risk. It was up to them to keep him afterward. So let's just say you're a business owner and you're listening to this. What can you do? If you give someone an incentive, if you bring someone in on a lower paying job or something that's a high turnover type of a thing, what, what you can do is you can put things in place ahead of time. Hey, I'm going to pay for your MBA. This is the waterfall schedule that you'd have to pay it back. However, within six months, of finishing your MBA, if you complete these tasks, you'll be promoted to this role. You do it all proactively. The person knows what they're chasing and what they're going after. It takes a little bit of organization on your part, but if you can lay those things out, then it's like, okay, I can do this and I can achieve these hurdles and benchmarks. I work my ass off for this, here's the reward. And if you work at a small company like mine, you can negotiate some of that stuff. Like what's important, I I would ask, what's important to you? Like I don't do an MBA reward program, but we do other things and and I get buy-in from the employee of what do you want to accomplish and what would you like the reward to be? So that way there's a hurdle in place that you can attain, you set, and then you're rewarded for it. And, And why would your employees need an MBA when you pay for them to go through Ian Matthews leadership training from five on four group? There's no doubt. Why would they possibly need an MBA after that kind of amazing world-class leadership training? So exactly. the next one is a bit strange and this one took us a while to really get our arms wrapped around. So quote, um, my manager trained me for my current position has been an incredible ally and friend. Um, but recently he's not been treated well by our company. He has a new boss and that new boss loathes him undeservedly. They canceled the raise that he was supposed to get, and they are now recruiting someone to come in and replace him. 
I have been nervous and passively networking and seeing what's out there. And I know my manager is actively hunting for a job. It turns out we applied for the same job and got a first screen call. It looks like I am the one that they want to go further with and not my manager. He did not get a call back and I did. His concern now, the way I see it, I have three options. I can think of myself first, go for the interview and try to get the job. I could too vouch for my manager and exit the interview process and let him try to get the job. Or I could try for a difficult, you should hire both of us um, conversation uh, rather than just going for it myself. So he's asking me, what should I do? And, and I, think, I think the general theme here is just, how do, how do you handle interviewing for the same job that a friend is interviewing for? Um, this, is, this has happened to me um, before. This happened to me in college when I interviewed for the same entry level jobs. This happened to me um, a couple of times at GE when I knew another manager was interviewing for a job. So um, I, this is a, a bit of a weird one, but I, I also kind of see this Let's use the dating example again. If uh, you're a girl and uh, your girlfriend and you both are wanna go out with the same guy and that guy likes you, if you come over to that guy and say, you shouldn't date me, you should really date my friend. It's only gonna make that guy want you more. It's not going to, he's not gonna be like, oh good, thanks for the suggestion. Let me go date your friend. It's gonna it's gonna make him wanna pursue you more. And you're only gonna be seen as weird by selling her more or selling, why don't you go out with both of us at the same time? It's the same thing with, with a job. Go get the job, tell your boss, who's your friend, I'm also interviewing for that job and let the best man win. Like, don't, don't be soft about this. Let the best man win and be honest. Yeah, they called me back, I'm going to a second interview. Oh, they didn't call you back, I'm sorry to hear that. but. It's, if you just are, if it bothers you that much, don't apply for the job. But if it's a well-paying solid job, what the hell? Like, go, go get it. That, that's free market capitalism. I, I don't have a ton to add here. I've been in the same situation. I think you take the opportunity to win the job. And I think it's important for you to talk to your friends. Like if, like, if you both meet a company at a job fair, for example, and you both apply, no harm, no foul. If your friend tells you about it, and then you apply also, and they pick you over that person, that's a different scenario. Like, but to me, I would say, hey, you're applying for that job. Could I apply for that job? Or do you care? Like, you know, the, the, thinking about these things ahead of time. Um, th th that's kind of it. Like when, when Nickel and I apply at the Outback, the guy that came out and interviewed us, he's like, just an FYI, it's really dumb sorry, to come to a job interview with your buddy. Like you should have come here individually because what if I only had one slot? I, I maybe don't hire either of you. And we're like, okay, but we think you should hire both of us because we're great. We didn't say that, but that's what we thought in the car, right? And then like eight weeks goes by and the guy comes up to us and he's like- Were you guys like uh, the, the two and stepbrothers with the tuxedos on interviewing together at the same time for an Outback job? No, I've never seen that movie, but no. But it, it, like it, a couple of months later, he comes up to us and he goes, I told you guys not to come in an interview together. He goes, if you guys ever want to work anywhere together again, I'll call that manager for you and say, hire both of them. So like, like these things tend to work out. When I was in college, like we, we met a bunch of companies at job fairs, and then I would go with my buddies to job interviews. And sometimes, you know, one of us would get an offer, the other one wouldn't it all comes down to personal preference. And it, it, it like, it, again, don't overthink this, get your foot in the door and then things tend to work out. Perfectly said. Next one is a little bit about um, loyalty when you are not actively looking for a job and someone pursues you. Um, so quote, I have an opportunity to, to apply for uh, executive management position. Um, I have a good friend who recommended me to her manager and I was not, I was not approaching this company in the first place. They've come to me. It's a big job and that is scary and exciting at the same time. It is hundred percent remote and I have to work in an office every day and the pay would be much better. Here's my dilemma. 
I am not unhappy in my current role, maybe a little bored. I'm still doing the same job I was before, and my manager manages the staff very well, gives us time off, our salary and reviews are fair. They have been very good to me, and my people-pleasing thing is making me feel bad for considering leaving. Plus, we are still very busy, and I know me leaving would not be a good thing for them. I just had my review, and it was wonderful, and I got a high-level rating and a nice raise. Here comes the guilt. I have never left a company before when I was okay being there. I've only left when I've been on the happy. I only have six more years left to work before I retire and not sure if moving right now would be the right direction to go in. So the question here is, is it okay to leave a company when you are currently happy with your job? I'm going to let you go first because I'm not paying attention to any of that other stuff. I'm paying attention to something else. You got one thing on here you're, that I know that you're kind of locked in on. So I think for me, whether you are looking for a job or not looking for a job, I think you owe it to yourself and your family to pursue the best available option for you. Um, and if it falls on your falls out of the sky and lands on your face like it did for this woman, then okay, that's great. You got a little bit lucky, but just because you're happy doesn't mean you can't be happier. And I think that that's, that's a trade-off that this person isn't really thinking about. They, they, and this, Frankie, I don't know what you think about this, but I, I kind of take this a little bit as the confidence thing again of I'm happy, things are okay, they treat me okay. Well, do you want to be okay or do you want to be fantastic? Like, how much do you believe in your talent and your abilities? Do you want something amazing or do you want okay? And so I... I feel like feeling guilty about taking something better. If your manager really is that cool and you really are that good with them and you share what you could be making, how good the opportunity is with them, if they're the person you think they are, they're gonna say, wow, take that job. That's great, I'm so happy for you. And if they aren't, if they're like, how could you do this to me? Are they really your friend? Or are they just selfishly being nice to you because it was in their best interest? So, so I think this depends. If you're 25, I think you should absolutely look into this other career move and make potentially make the move based on what I hear. The thing in here that I hear is I have six more years to work before I retire. I would look at that opportunity two different ways. Working for six more years, you have a finite period of time. Because of your age, and you can't discriminate but at the same time, people consider things. I mean, they weigh, they weigh options. So if you are a little bit older and you have some time to ride it out until you're going to retire, are you going to make it six years at this new place? Or are you going to have to look for other employment in a couple of years? Like if you're in a stable situation and you're trading that for less stable, you might like make a little bit more money, you might be a little bit more happy, but at the same time, it, it, it might backfire. The other side of it is, what if this is a better opportunity? What if this other company will give you more money? What if retirement is you have banked money and then you need to live off of it? My mother-in-law did this. She thought she had like six to eight years left. She went to a better company that paid her more money. That was an opportunity that allowed her to work from home. She banked more money and she worked there longer than she initially thought she was going to. And when she retired, she had more money than she thought she was going to because it was a better opportunity. So I think you have to weigh all parts of this. And I think you have to be very truthful of where are you in your job arc? Like, am I in the beginning and I have more time to make it up? Or am I towards the end and I need to be a little bit more strategic and, and have some strategy around? I need to make sure I have enough. Out of all the things people say when they retire, one thing that is rarely spoken is, um, wow, I think I finished with a little more than I needed. You never heard. Never, never heard. You don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know what kind of things are going to come up in your life. You don't know. You don't know. So the the more you can put into a nest egg when you retire, the better. Always. That no one ever immediately says that should be enough. Everyone's always a little like, ah, am I too early? Doesn't matter whether you're you're 75 or 65 or 41 like me like you're always worried is this enough for me to go it alone and live off of what i have so i think i think 
yes, you need to kind of consider some of those things. But I also think if something really good comes along your way, you'd be foolish not to look into it seriously. So uh, I'm a big believer in just truth, radical honesty, radical candor, whatever. If I'm six years away from retirement and I'm sitting in front of somebody, I would ask those questions. Like I'm 59 years old. I'm going to retire at 65. Like, I think this is a great opportunity, but I would like to understand the growth trajectory of this company. What do you think's happening in the next six years? Where are you going? Is there going to be a need for me? Like the, these are real questions that I think you can ask. And I think if you're, if you're with an obtuse manager, they're going to look at that and say, what a selfish prick. But if you're with the right person and this is the right opportunity, they're going to talk to you and say, look, we've got other people who are older who excel for these reasons. Um, my best salesman is, is over the age of 60. He's incredible. He doesn't want to retire for any time soon. So, but we talk about like different planning events in his life. So like, I think owning it, talking about it and making a good critical decision is, 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 is the right move. And if you're honest with your situation with somebody, like you don't want to have diarrhea of the mouth, but if you're honest with your situation, you're, you're showing critical thinking skills and planning and forward looking a good manager is going to look at that and say, that's the kind of person I want on my team. This is a forward thinking person. I love it. So let's, let's finish this episode off with just a few questions, a, a couple of open-ended questions. So um, first question I've got is when is it smart to be loyal? So this is going to sound confusing. I think it's always smart to be loyal. I don't think loyalty has ever been a disservice to me. Now, when does it make sense to make a change? That I don't think is necessarily, change is different than loyalty. I'm still loyal to NVR. I think it's a great place. It taught me incredible things, but the time for me was right to go. I still support them. If I see something and can push business their way, I do. But for me, the time was right to be loyal and to make a move that benefited me. So I would say that fulcrum is, are you no longer best suited staying there? And when that changes, it's the, the time to make the decision to me has come. I think the question's a little bit loaded. And when you say, when is it smart to be loyal? If you're asking when it's smart to be loyal, you don't need to be loyal when everything's amazing. So if you're paying me a ton, my manager's awesome, company's growing, we're having a blast. No one's ever like, are you going to be loyal? Well, it's not loyalty, that's selfishness. I'm sticking around because it's amazing right now. I think the only time you have to be loyal is when times get a little tough, when things are a little dicey, when things aren't going your way, after you got passed over for a promotion, maybe when you got a raise that you weren't terribly happy with. Um, Maybe when you saw someone get fired in your office that you thought was a good person. I think loyalty only shows when you're tested, when you're not 100% happy with how things are going in the company. And my answer there would be it's smart to be loyal when that stuff happens. If you still really believe in the leadership of the company, the people that are running the place, the mission, if you believe that the company has long-term value, I think then it's smart to be loyal because Really what you're answering there is, um, when is it smart to think about the long-term for yourself? Um, so I think, I think for me, when I've been loyal, I, I've, when I've thought about it, it's been times where Ian has been getting everything he wanted out of his career from a company, but I knew long-term sticking it out I would get more than everything I needed. So maybe I kept working for a shitty boss at a great company, but I knew he wouldn't last. I knew I could outlast him. And I'm gonna stick around because the company is worth it to me to stick around and work for this guy, even though I know he's terrible because he won't make it. And I'm still gonna get paid a lot in the long term, more than if I could leave and go somewhere else and do something different. So I think it's smart to be loyal when it's in your best interest in the long term, that's when I think it's strong. And you're only tested on loyalty when things aren't going well. No one's tested on loyalty when everything's perfect. So, 
is loyalty always rewarded? I, so loyalty is not always rewarded, uh, 100% not. Um, what, what you have to understand in businesses is managers get changed out, owners get changed out, uh, debt gets called, p- companies get into trouble, uh, or companies get purchased, acquired, reorganized, faces change, everything can change. And when that happens, the, the only loyalty that really works is the loyalty between you and maybe someone else that trusted you, that you worked with. If that person's out, there's no loyalty of the person replacing that. In fact, they're going to put people in positions that were loyal to them wherever they came from. And if that was from a different company, so be it. You're going to be, you're starting over from scratch every time you get a new manager that comes in. So is it always rewarded? No. Is it rewarded often? I think so. I think if, if all things are considered, the management stays pretty stable in your company and it's a smart company that's growing. I know I've rewarded loyalty. I've, I've promoted people that have been with me for through some tough times um, it, because I think, I think here's a different way of saying it, Frank. Um, when you say reward loyalty, um, here's people that have been loyal, at least to the company I was in and worked for me. Their loyalty was tested in a recession. It was tested when things were tough. And so I got to see them work in the worst of conditions. And so when things got better, I knew what they were made of. It wasn't that they were loyal to me. It was that they got to prove themselves in a really crappy uh, environment or market or situation. And so when things got better and I could promote them, I wanted to because I knew how tough they were. I knew what they were made of. So you can only be in a foxhole with so many people. What, what it comes down to in some instances is familiarity. Like, could you potentially upgrade or get slightly better somewhere? Sure. But what's the brain damage that's going to go into it? What's the la- loss of continuity that you're going to have? What, what, are, what are those things that you are going to have to, 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 de- to deal with? So what I do think is I do think loyalty is rewarded, but I don't think loyalty is rewarded above performance. If someone's super loyal to you and your performance goes to hell in a handbasket, I think you I, I think you're in jeopardy, no matter how close you are with someone. However, if the person you're close with goes away and your performance is still incredible, I think you will find yourself very quickly rewarded because if a new manager comes in and they don't know you from the outside, the last thing a new manager wants to do, unless they're just in a complete restructure, is start with all new staff. It's mm-hmm. critical for a new manager to have people they can rely on. And if in a couple of weeks, a couple of months time, you prove that you are invaluable, you will very quickly earn the loyalty of a new manager because of the performance. Well, I think so. There's another piece of this, Frank, that I would put back on you. So let's say you've been at a company for five or six years and you feel like your company is very loyal to you. The managers like you, they trust you, but the upside just isn't great financially. Um, And you get an opportunity to go somewhere where there's much better, like let's say 30, 40, 50% more income, but you're going to be starting all over again with all new managers that don't know anything about you, except they interviewed you and you have, you can go in there, but you're going to have to prove yourself. You're going to start over from scratch. If you're in sales, maybe you got to go find new customers or manager. You got to build a new team, but you don't have any of the loyalty. You just have a bunch more money and the expect to me, the expectations are going to be 50% higher because they're paying you 50% more. So where's that trade-off between staying where people are loyal to you um, and or leaving the company for financial upside, but much more stress where you haven't built the same kind of loyalty for you? Right. So, so basically, what's the trade-off between financial upside and stress? So I think there's a sweet spot there. And I think you need to be honest. If someone's willing to give you 50% more pay, why? Are you doing the same job? Are you taking a completely different job? What are you not asking? What's different about the position? What's, is the comp uncertain? Those are things I would look at. So here, here's, here's a, a great way to answer this. 
my brother-in-law has worked for Capital One for somewhere between 15 and 20 years. And his wife, my sister-in-law, also works at Capital One. And what happened was they're very, very prudent. They're both, they're both in finance, they're both accountants. They're conservative people. They live well below their means and they can easily afford to live on one of their salaries. He was approached by a company that is a rocket ship. And it's very different than Capital One. And he actually called me to talk about it um, before he accepted the job. And he, he thought through it. And what he decided was, okay, I lose all my loyalty. I lose all my continuity, but we can afford to live as a family on my wife's salary comfortably. This is a shot that's worth taking. It's a shot that's worth taking a chance on because it could financially change our family's future. We could retire earlier. Um, but the fallback is if he lost a job or quit or it was the wrong job, he can probably find something else to get into because the, he, didn't, he didn't have to act in desperation. He could act in a way that was prudent because of how he set up his life. So I think it's a very, it's a very individualistic thing. And you have to ask yourself that. Like when I have people come to me and say, I've been, I've been offered X, that conversation happens, especially in a really good economy. You got to sit down and talk to people and say, what's the opportunity? What does it look like? What are you going to be doing different? Like these are real conversations that, you know, that happen. And I think you're right. I think the situation matters. You know, if you're young, if you're in your twenties, um, that's when you should be, you know, thirties, you should be taking on more stress for more financial upside. That's, that's the time to do it. If, you know, you've got a couple of kids that just went away to college and they're now out of your house and you have find yourself with lots of free time and you have a nice little nest egg already built up. Take a little chance, take some risk. That's okay. You built up that loyalty. If you've got a toddler at home and a new baby on the way, maybe not a great time to go trade financial upside for the extra stress of a new manager, no stability, different times in your life call for different approaches to go after. I think, I think you've got to really take stock of when I'm not at work, what other stresses are going on in my life right now. Yeah, Be being truthful and honest of where you are is important. So I think the, the last question that we want to answer before we can wrap this thing up is, how do you earn a team's loyalty as a manager? And um, I think that the easiest way to do this is this. Treat every person like a person, an individual. Understand them, know them, treat them right. I'm getting to a point in my business where I don't know everybody as well as I did initially, but I encourage the manager to make sure they know them individually and very well and can communicate with them. Like make that person, don't make them, treat them right. Give them opportunity, understand them, reward them, challenge them, make the point crystal clear that their career is in good, is in great shape in your hands. And if you do that, that breeds the loyalty that you're trying to breed in employees. And it's not an infallible method, but it's one of those things that cause a lot of the questions that we talked about above, because if you do it right, your employees are going to struggle to leave because they know that you're looking out for them, you're treating them well, and you're rewarding them. I think, I think an important piece here is not assuming that anyone should be loyal to you for the sake of being loyal to you. I think, um, that, 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 exactly. I think, you know, being married 19 years, that doesn't mean Jenny should stay with me at 20th. I, we still have to go on dates. I still have to treat her with respect. I still have to do, I still have to produce. I, I still have to, you know, be a good person to live with. I, I, I have to earn it. Like if, if you stop earning anything, the loyalty out of loyalty's sake doesn't really work. You, you have to, I think employees, when you need loyalty is when things are going hard, when you can't give everyone everything, when the company's going through a challenge and they'll look back and you might get a little bit of loyalty because they'll see how you've behaved and what decisions you've made in the past when you've been under duress. Um, 
but ultimately you have to keep earning it. And if they can find better opportunities than they can find with you, then they're going to go take it. They're not going to be loyal to a fault for themselves. So I think loyalty is something you just earn all the time with treating people with respect, giving them opportunities to grow, giving them the things that are important to them in life, paying them a good uh, income based on the market. If you do all those things, I think loyalty takes care of itself because it's self. You should make the experience of an employee um, so strong that it's self-serving for them to be loyal. They're not loyal because they feel guilty that they wanna be great to Frank or to Ian. They're loyal because it's self-serving. That's to so, me what it should be. So the way, the way that you're stating this is, is similar to how I feel and I would summarize it like this. Loyalty is kind of like inertia. If your inertia is going in the right direction, the loyalty is gonna follow it. If you have a bad day, you get thrown off track, but you're a good person overall and inertia is pulling you in this direction, loyalty is going to follow. But self-preservation is undefeated. If something changes to a point where if, like my wife has given me a list of things that I must do if she, you know, if, if she's going to stay with me. And it's, it's a pretty easy list. Like I can't get addicted to drugs or do anything that puts our family in harm's way. I can't be financially risky. Now, that doesn't mean if my business goes belly up that she won't stick with me. But if I start gambling, if I'm abusive verbally or if I'm abusive physically, like those are the things that are going to cause her to no longer be loyal to me. She told me this before we got married. Like those seem like pretty easy hurdles to cross. So what I would tell you is though, like if you cross those hurdles, it's pretty clear. There's probably hurdles like that with every single person who you work with that you manage that you just need to understand them. And a lot of people give you grace, but they won't give you grace forever. So th th that's kind of how I- Those are too easy and those are too obvious. I mean, anyone is going to leave anyone if they're abusive physically. I think what goes unsaid there is if you go long enough without giving her any attention or making her feel important, she will leave you. That's that's a fact. And that's the same with an employee at work. Like, it's easy to say, you're fired if you steal from me. Or, you know, it's easy for me to say, I'll quit here if you ever call me a son of a bitch in front of everyone. Like, those are obvious and okay. But, but the truth is, most people leave when they just over time stop feeling important. Yeah. And stop getting intention or... Like that's when people leave most companies when they just kind of feel like, well, I'm kind of insignificant here. Loyalty comes from feeling like you're an important part of what is going on there. For, for sure. But I use the term inertia for a reason. Inertia runs out if there isn't gasoline in the car, if there isn't fuel on the flame or there isn't wood in the fire. You need to constantly stoke it. Like you might have an ability without stoking it day over day that'll pull you along, but you do need critical checkpoints. Every single person needs to feel important. Every single person needs to be heard, needs to be challenged, needs to be feeling like they're growing and getting better. One of our like key components of our business is I tell people all the time, like if I've hired you and you tell me you want to be doing the exact same thing five years from now, you probably don't fit here because I want people who want to grow and evolve and get better because life is growing and evolving. Death is stagnation. So it's, it, and, and then as, as the CEO of a company, it's my desire to empower managers, who empower people that continue to keep things exciting, fresh, and show growth. And then what does growth look like? Growth looks like something different to every person, but you know what you're doing every day is feeding something that is getting better. Well, I know that I would never get a job offer at Kava Companies because in five years, I want to be doing exactly what Ian Matthews does today. My life is just so goddamn good. I want to be doing the exact same shit I'm doing today. Maybe with one less podcast, maybe one less podcast. But other than that, man, I, I want to be doing exactly what I'm doing now. Exactly. <laughs> hey, Frankie, good hanging out with you, dude. Ian, it's always a pleasure. See you, bro. See ya.